Hello, welcome to the 2020 Anthony Burgess Lecture. Um, it's going to be delivered by Professor Richard Green, who is the author of this new biography of Graham Greene, just published, Russian Roulette. Um, the American title is The Quiet Englishman, but it's the same book on both sides of the Atlantic, heavily recommended. Now, Graham Greene and Anthony Burgess have a long history, which goes back to their first meeting in 1957, uh, when Greene met Burgess. Uh, Burgess had just come back from Malaya, and he brought a present from a friend of Greene's and also a copy of his first novel, which he inscribed to Greene. And then a few years later, he dedicated um, one of his early novels, Devil of a State, to Graham Greene. And they remained in contact thereafter uh, and until towards the end of Greene's life when there was a, a final and catastrophic falling out. However, Greene is one of the reasons why Burgess became a writer and also one of the reasons why he chose his publisher because William Heinemann had been Greene's publisher since the 1920s. And when Burgess started writing in the 1950s, he sent his two unpublished novels to Heinemann who rejected them. And he didn't send them anywhere else. He was determined to be published by Greene's publisher. And so eventually, Time for a Tiger, which was his third novel, was published as his first novel in 1956. Now, Richard Greene, who's going to tell us about Graham Greene and his history in the world of espionage is a very distinguished writer. He's professor of English at Toronto University. He's also a prize-winning poet. He's been awarded the Governor General's Prize in Canada. And he's previously written A Life of Edith Sitwell, and he's produced an edition of Graham Greene's Letters, uh, a book called A Life in Letters. His new biography, I would say, is easily the best life of Graham Greene. Yes, I have read all the others, and this is the best book about Greene that's been attempted so far. And Richard is delivering his lecture, sadly, from Toronto, sadly for us, because uh, he wanted to be here in person, but uh, he's going to give the lecture from his home in Toronto. Professor Richard Greene. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation is a unique and wonderful organization. I'm very grateful to its director, Professor Andrew Biswell, and his colleagues for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm very conscious that I follow in the footsteps of Dame Margaret Drapple and Jonathan Meads, and I'm humbled by that knowledge. It's unfortunate that the pandemic forces us to record this lecture, as I would love to meet more of the friends and supporters of the foundation. I hope I will be able to do that before long. Today, I want to speak to you about Graham Greene and the spies. But it is only fair that I should start with Anthony Burgess. It's well known that the two novelists had a public spat in June 1988, following Burgess's tart comments on a French television program about Greene's age and his years of correspondence with the defector Kim Philby, who had just died. Green wrote Burgess a pair of angry letters on the same day, recommending him one that he see a psychiatrist. And that was that. After many years of pleasant, if not close association, the two had nothing more to do with each other. And yet Burgess was, in effect, asking a question that was on many people's minds. Graham Greene had been Philby's staunchest defender in the West since the time of his defection in 1963. He had written an introduction to Philby's memoir, My Silent War, and eventually engaged in a correspondence with him, which actually amounted to perhaps just a dozen letters on each side. Since 1986, Green had made a series of highly publicized visits to the Soviet Union, which had included meetings with Philby. Burgess, like everyone else, wanted to know what Graham Greene was up to. Of course, Burgess had long been interested in the older novelist's involvement in the secret world and was a great admirer of his spy novels. For example, when The Human Factor came out in 1978, he wrote in The Observer, let me say at once that The Human Factor is as fine a novel as he has ever written, concise, ironic, acutely observant of contemporary life, funny, shocking, above all compassionate. Will Carr, the deputy director of the foundation, tells me that much later, after the quarrel, he did find fault with the book, specifically on the subject of Lancashire hot pot. 
In his novel, The Human Factor, Mr. Graham Greene has the effrontery to add carrots to the dish. He promised to remove those carrots in a reissue of the book, but they are still redly and wrongly there. Redly and wrongly there is a great phrase and might also apply to Kim Philby's presence at MI6, but we'll come back to that. In any event, that particular novel, The Human Factor, is the story of what Green thought a morally justified defection. Indeed, it was something of a thought experiment. The double agent, Morris Castle, is a conservative character and actually opposed to Marxism. He leads a sober life with a mortgage, a dog, and a bicycle. He had once been stationed in South Africa where he fell in love with an African woman named Sarah and so was blackmailed by the security services there. He returned to London, protected by a diplomatic passport, but she had to escape with the aid of communist rebels. Out of love for her and gratitude to her protectors, he begins leaking material to the KGB, culminating in an appalling plan to back the apartheid regime with American nuclear weapons. Once that document is leaked, he must take refuge in Moscow, and so is separated from Sarah. Green spoke of the work as a sympathetic study of treachery. In the rest of this talk, I want to tell as concisely as I can the story of Green's involvement with MI6 and his dealings with men who turned out to be Soviet moles. I want to begin by disappointing some of those listening as I never did find anything to suggest that Green himself was working for the Soviets. He was a contrarian with a taste for paradox and a sympathy for outsiders, and he was never finished fighting the demons of his childhood. These things generally explain his sometimes startling public statements and actions. Green was recruited to MI6, also known as the Secret Intelligence Service, or SIS, in the summer of 1941. And perhaps it is helpful to bear in mind that this service gathers foreign intelligence and is very different from MI5, which investigates subversion and threats to internal security. Green disliked MI5 very much, seeing in its officers a species of school prefect and made them the villains of the human factor, responsible for killing a man who is incorrectly suspected of being a mole. After a period of training, Green was sent to West Africa in early 1942, a posting for which he had some qualification. As the author of Journey Without Maps about a trek through the back country of Sierra Leone and Liberia to investigate modern slavery on American-owned rubber plantations, he had a special knowledge of the region, which was otherwise hard to come by. Stationed in Freetown, he was provided with cover as a CID special branch officer, and his time there would later provide the inspiration and the setting for the heart of the matter. In truth, Graham Greene was a minor figure in British intelligence, but Freetown was a fairly important posting. Since the Mediterranean was closed, Convoys to Egypt and North Africa had to sail south towards the Cape of Good Hope with Freetown as the main port of call. At the same time, there was some threat of attack by Vichy forces across the border in French Guinea. So Green's job required him to monitor shipping and through a very small network of agents, keep track of any French troop movements inland. He searched Portuguese ships for contraband diamonds used in war industries. He interrogated a suspected spy just once and hated it. In the course of his posting, Green managed to get into a row with his superior stationed in Lagos, so that he was then placed directly under the command of London, and so was henceforth, without knowing it, getting his orders from Kim Philby. After a little over a year, Green was recalled to England to work in the Iberian subsection of SIS, Section 5, dedicated to counterintelligence. Since the summer of 1941, this subsection had been headed by Philby. Green took charge of the Portugal desk in the Section 5 headquarters, first at Glenalmond House and Edwardian Mansion in St. Albans, and then from late July 1943 at 14 Ryder Street off St. James's Street in London. 
The key point about Green's work in this subsection was that the supposedly neutral Salazar regime in Portugal, like that of Franco in Spain, was sympathetic to the Axis and allowed the Abwehr, the German intelligence service, to operate on its soil. However, the Salazar regime was not as openly pro-Nazi as the Spanish government, so Section 5 counterintelligence had to conduct itself more cautiously there for fear of driving the Portuguese further into the Nazi camp. What did Green's job involve in this unit? First, he performed the task, a very tiresome one, of compiling a large index known as the Purple Primer of enemy intelligence agents, officers, and contacts in Portugal. Philby wrote an introduction. His deputy, Tim Milne, Milne who is the nephew of A.A. A. Milne, updated and enlarged it, and later wrote in his memoir, memoir Perhaps this entitles me to go down in history as the co-author with Graham Greene and H.A.R. Philby of a volume privately printed in limited edition with numbered copies. Much of Greene's work would have involved signals intelligence, both Enigma material from Bletchley Park and another kind drawn from the broken hand ciphers of German intelligence. Whereas in Sierra Leone, Green was searching ships and making forays to the border. At St. Albans, he was tied to a desk, poring over intercepts, as well as a certain amount of intelligence from human sources. One visitor to Spain and Portugal, whom the subsection tracked carefully, was Admiral Wilhelm Canaris, head of the Abwehr. Philby proposed simply tossing a couple of grenades into his hotel room but his superiors rejected this plan since they knew that Canaris was sec secretly opposed to Hitler, wanted an early peace, and might be counted on to lead a coup. Indeed, Philby's desire to get rid of Canaris was precisely in line with Soviet plans to come as far west into Europe as possible, something a coup followed by a negotiated peace would prevent. As Philby's subordinate, Green caused trouble for Canaris personally by sending word of his locations to the Portuguese police. Arrested as part of Stauffenberg's plot against Hitler, Canaris was executed by garroting in April 1945. Green was involved with running some double agents, among them one codenamed Joseph, a Russian seaman who had been trained as a spy by the Soviets but then lost touch with them. MI6 ran him against the Japanese in Lisbon for two years from home ports in Newcastle and Glasgow, with Green handling and interpreting much of the hand cipher traffic relating to him. In the file on this case, there is a curious correspondence between Green and one of Joseph's case officers about a suspected spy aboard a ship headed to Britain who could be identified by his possession of four canaries. In a letter of 29th December 1943, Green, perhaps thinking of his children, added, your secretary has promised to reserve me one canary. Now, Tim Butcher, who has written a book about Green's travels in Africa, and a very good one, wonders whether these canaries might have something to do with a discreet effort by Green and others to get around Philby and make contact with Canaris. The, history of intel the historian of intelligence, Nigel West, however, thinks not. His view is essentially that even in the secret world, sometimes the canaries are real. The Iberian subsection had some involvement in one of the war's most important pieces of strategic deception, the Garbo case. Green's own involvement in this affair was slight, but the story and others similar to it remained with him and helped to shape the plot of Our Man in Havana in 1958. This case was unraveled by Nigel West. In January 1941, a Spaniard named Juan Pujols Garcia, who hated Hitler, offered himself to the British Embassy in Madrid as a willing spy against the Germans, but they rebuffed him. He then went to the German Embassy and volunteered to go to Britain as a jur journalist and spy on behalf of the Nazis. By October, he was in Portugal sending the Germans bogus reports concocted with the aid of a Bideker, a Bradshaw, and an Ordnance Survey map. In his first message, he claimed the assistance of a KLM pilot. In fact, a KLM pilot 
was known to the British to be a spy. In another message, he described a convoy of ships from Liverpool to Malta with a freakish resemblance to one that actually sailed. Intercepting these reports, British intelligence at first believed that a master spy was at work. He then contacted an American official in Lisbon who took him seriously, just as the British finally worked out that he was really operating from Portugal. He was taken by ship to Gibraltar, then flown to England in April 1942. Having been originally codenamed Bovril, he was renamed Garbo in tribute to his acting skills. Under the guidance of his MI5 case officer, Thomas Harris, he fed a great deal of false information to the Germans and convinced them of the reality of 26 invented sub-agents. He was a prized asset of German intelligence and just before D-Day, a message of his had great influence with the high command, hoping to convince them that landings at Normandy were a diversion and that the real attack would come near Calais. Indeed, that message was initialed by Field Marshal Yodel and presented to Hitler. A hero to both sides, Juan Pujol Garcia was secretly awarded both an MBE and an Iron Cross. During his time in the counterintelligence unit, Green struck up friendships with two of the five members of the Cambridge spy ring. At a glance, Green and the Cambridge spies have privileged backgrounds in common, but Green saw it differently. He wrote, all five concerned were at Cambridge long after I was at Oxford. Generations at university go in three years. I belong to the 1922 generation and Kim and the others belong to a much later one at the beginning of the 30s. It was then apparent that Germany was the main threat and the hunger marchers were busy. It was more natural in the early 30s to side with our possible ally, Russia. His friendship with John Cairncross, a Scotsman, began in June 1943 with them taking the same train to St. Albans, where Green came upon him reading one of his novels. At St. Albans, Cairncross was technically Green's subordinate but was shunted off to other work. A fondness developed between them and Green dubbed him Claymore. However, having been recruited by the Soviets in 1937, Cairncross did a great deal of harm. Fluent in German, he was sent in 1942 to work on ultra decrypts at Bletchley and provided the Soviets with thousands of documents. When the war was over, he entered the civil service and provided the Soviets with an array of sensitive military information, including nuclear secrets. These things are especially evident if one looks at the huge Mitrokin archive brought to the West by a defecting KGB officer, Vasily Mitrokin, and brought into print by the historian Christopher Andrew. Once Guy Burgess and Donald McLean defected in 1951, Cairn Cross was suspected of treason and forced out of the civil service. He confessed to MI5 in 1964. Shortly after Anthony Blunt's exposure, Cairn Cross was publicly identified as the fifth man in the Cambridge spy ring. In the 1980s, he turned to Graham Greene for help with a defensive memoir and with his problems of residency in France, sending him many long letters. Always sympathetic to outcasts and underdogs, Greene tried to help. It has been suggested to me by a former intelligence officer that Greene may have been encouraged by the service to remain friendly with Karen Cross in later years so that he would feel more assured of a warm reception from British intelligence if he felt like confessing more extensively, or he was willing to name other traitors. On a day-to-day -day basis in 1943 and 4, Green saw far less of Karen Cross than of Kim Philby, and indeed they became drinking companions. Philby's own story is well known. Convinced of Marxism as a student, he was recruited by the NKVD in Austria in 1934. At the instruction of his controllers, he recreated himself as a man of the right, going to Spain for the Times in 1937, where he wrote admiringly about Franco. Brought into the intelligence services by Guy Burgess, he moved to SIS Section 5 Counterintelligence in 1941, where he was given charge of the Iberian section under Felix Cowgill. In the following year, he was made responsible also for Italy and North Africa, 
including Green Station in Sierra Leone. While at St. Albans, he poured over the archives, especially the two-volume source book detailing all SIS agents in the Soviet Union. With war ending, German espionage was fading, and it was necessary to refocus counterintelligence on the Soviets. So a new unit, Section 9, was set up. Philby told his controllers what was going on, and they insisted that he get himself appointed head of this new section, a job that would ordinarily have gone to Felix Cowgill, the capable but sometimes cantankerous head of Section 5. Philby set to work in March and finally got the appointment in September while Cowgill was traveling in Italy. On his return, Cowgill protested in vain to C, the chief of MI6, Stuart Menzies, and resigned shortly after. Himself a Soviet agent, Philby was now in control of the efforts of MI6 against Soviet spies. In the midst of this intrigue, Graham Greene left his position in MI6. Indeed, his resignation coincided with D-Day, and it is difficult to understand how a trusted intelligence officer could leave the service at that moment. 24 years later, Green offered this account in his preface to Philby's memoir. I saw the beginning of this affair, section nine. Indeed, I resigned rather than accept the promotion, which was one tiny cog in the machinery of his intrigue. I attributed it then to a personal drive for power the only characteristic in Philby I thought disagreeable. I am now glad that I was wrong. He was serving a cause and not himself, and so my old liking for him comes back. Green liked to provoke his readers. Here he suggests that an ambitious bureaucrat was somehow worse than an agent betraying many people to their deaths in the service of Joseph Stalin. So, why did Graham Greene leaves Section 5 in June 1944. One possibility is that Philby tried to recruit him as an agent, and Greene ch chose to quit rather than turn Philby in. Or perhaps he did make a report and was then removed from Section 5 so that Philby would not sniff out what had happened. Nigel West thinks this scenario very improbable, since Philby had tried independent recruitment once before and it nearly destroyed his relationship with the NKVD. And of course, why approach Graham Greene rather than his superior Tim Milne, who would have been a much more useful recruit? Philby was himself far too valuable an asset to be allowed to take any such risks for so little gain. Milne maintains that it is wrong to see Philby as trying to take over Section 5 in early 1944. In September 1943, Calgill himself promoted Philby to a position from which he controlled much of Section 5 anyway, and Milne was made head of the Iberian subsection. By the late winter, Philby's attention was on Section 9, that's the new section to pursue the Soviets. Green was offered a routine promotion, and he took Philby, Milne, and an administrative officer to lunch at the Café Royal to persuade them to leave him in his current post. And then, he resigned altogether. A number of writers have proposed that Graham Greene somehow saw into Kim Philby's heart and mind and perceived that he was leading a double life. To my mind, this is a sentimental, even bizarre reading of the evidence in order to set up an interpretation of the character of Harry Lyme in The Third Man. Green had actually been describing betrayals of mentors and dominant friends since his first novel, The Man Within, and having experienced betraying, betrayal and bullying in school, he did not need Philby to inspire such a plot. Many years later, Tim Milne wrote a memoir of Philby, which could not be published until 2014. In it, he says that after seeing Green's account of his resignation, he asked for details. Their letters are actually preserved at Boston College. Green said he could remember nothing specific, just an impression of ambition and intrigue on the part of Philby. It is entirely possible then that Green had read subsequent revelations about Philby into his memories of 1944. Simpler answers present themselves. Green was a man easily bored. 
He'd been doing desk work for a year at a very modest salary and was tired of it. By the 1st of May 1944, the Political Intelligence Department of the Foreign Office offered him a job with a promise to send him to France following the invasion, the kind of adventure he always craved. The most likely explanation of Green's desire to leave MI6 for a less demanding position lies in a script writing contract he signed with MGM on the 3rd of February 1944, providing him with 12 weeks of work in each of two years at the very handsome rate of 250 pounds per week. MGM wanted to get Green working as soon as possible, so included a requirement that once hostilities ended, quote, he will use his best endeavors to obtain his release and discharge from compulsory national service at the earliest possible date. He was also required to keep MGM apprised of the steps he was taking to obtain release and act on any suggestions they might give. It seems that Kim Philby's conduct played at most a minor part in Green's departure from Section 5 counterintelligence. Green did take the job offered by the Foreign Office, but they reneged on the promise of sending him to France. He did return to script writing and after the war took up a job in publishing. Of course, one rarely leaves the intelligence services altogether. And in the years that followed, Green took on occasional tasks for SIS, notably in Vietnam, where, as the historian Kevin Ruain has shown, he scouted possible Catholic leaders to take over from the French colonizers and so keep the country out of communist hands. On one occasion, he was sent with a secret message to Ho Chi Minh, the contents of which are still not known. And yet it seems that Green had little or no contact with Kim Philby for many years. In 1951, Philby's mask fell away. Working in Washington, he warned Guy Burgess that Donald McLean was under suspicion, and this tip-off led to the escape of both men to the Soviet Union. In a sense, Philby was left holding the bag. According to Philip Knightley, he was brought to a form of trial by MI5 in November 1951. Those present thought him guilty, but there was just not enough evidence to convict him. He was, however, forced to resign from the Foreign Office, and he later said that he ended his friendship with Graham Greene at this time in order to spare him trouble. In 1955, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI leaked information to journalists that Philby had tipped off Burgess and McLean in 1951, allowing them to escape to Moscow. And so, Philby became known to the world, in Graham Greene's phrase, as the third man of the spy ring. The Foreign Secretary, Harold Macmillan, disliked the intelligence services and was not much interested in the case. In exchange for Philby's sacking, he was still technically on the books of SIS, and a reorganization of the service Macmillan made a statement to the House of Commons on the 7th of November 1955, clearing him of suspicion. Philby followed with a circus-like circus press conference from his mother's flat, in which, with a smirk and a tongue rolling inside his cheek, he answered many of the questions with no comment and made solemn references to the Official Secrets Act. With the help of his closest friend in the service, Nicholas Elliott, Philby became a correspondent in Beirut for The Observer and The Economist in mid-1956. In 1960, Elliot, by then head of station in Beirut, brought him back as an agent, perhaps in order to have him feed traceable information to the Soviets, thus revealing him as a traitor. In any event, evidence against him was mounting, and even Elliot finally agreed that his friend must be guilty. A highly placed KGB figure, Anatoly Golitsyn, brought clues concerning the identity of Soviet agents when he defected to the West in 1961, and an old friend of Philby's named Flora Solomon revealed his early communist sympathies. Elliot was sent to confront Philby in January 1963, and their meetings have been much written about. At first, Philby remarked, I rather thought it would be you. This troubling comment contained a hint that some other moles still active in the service had warned him to expect an inquisitor. Elliot offered immunity if he told all he knew. Philby confirmed that he had been a Soviet agent and provided a two-page confession, which Elliot took back to London. 
Philby then turned to his controllers, who got him onto a freighter bound for Odessa, and by the end of the month, he was in Moscow. The sudden disappearance of a long-suspected traitor became international news and, indeed, part of a huge controversy concerning spies. It even coincided with the Profumo affair. On the 1st of July, 1963, Edward Heath, as Lord Privy Seal, confirmed in the House of Commons that Philby had indeed spied for the Soviet Union and that he was now likely in an Eastern Bloc country. There followed a scouring of the intelligence service services and Michael Sheldon tells us that Graham Greene, as a former associate of the defector, was interviewed by MI5 and cleared of complicity, though the inter interviewer felt he knew more than he was saying. It would have been entirely in character for the contrary, often defiant, Graham Greene to be a resistant witness, especially under aggressive questioning. If the interviewer tried to push him around, he would push back harder. That was his personality. Indeed, he despised the investigators, later remarking, I don't think I've ever had a friend in MI5, thank God. Presumably, his distaste for that branch of service went back to their proposal to arrest him over Our Man in Havana, published in 1958, as it gave an exact account of the dealings of a head of station with an agent in the field. When he heard of the plan to put the novelist on trial at the Old Bailey, Sir Dick Franks, then head of MI6, just laughed it off as nonsense. And yet Green himself probably took it seriously. So when the time came, Green, bearing a grudge, told the Inquisitors no more about his old friend than he had to. He was not going to do their job for them. In the lost boyhood of Judas, Christ was betrayed. Graham Greene often quoted these lines from the Irish poet A.E., and they may have guided his first public comment on Philby's defection. In a satirical piece called A Third Man Entertainment on Security in Room 51, which came out in the Sunday Times just after Edward Heath's statement to the House of Commons, Green declared a great affection for Philby. He spoke of their working together in an Edwardian house in Ryder Street that their service shared with the OSS, the forerunner of the CIA. Green asked, which of us then we're betraying secrets to our American allies. Which of us in the far past at Oxford and Cambridge have been corrupted by the capitalist way of life? In a sense, Green's defense of Philby began in the dormitory at Berkhamsted School, where he had been caught between loyalty to the other boys and loyalty to his father, the headmaster, out of which emerged a personal mythology concerning trust and betrayal. Growing up under the shadow of the Great War, he found nationalism distasteful and he preferred loyalty to individuals over loyalty to states. He absorbed a long-standing Catholic disdain for American forms of culture and government as one of the soulless outcomes of the Enlightenment. And his anti-Americanism grew most acute after his sojourns in Vietnam. He felt that American meddling in foreign countries was as bad as that of the Russians, so he was not going to be sanctimonious if an old friend happened to have looked east when most Britons were looking west. In addition to all this, Green liked fights, and he liked underdogs, and he despised MI5. He was going to stand up for Kim Philby. Although Graham Greene is better known for his anti-Americanism, he became at this time, in his paradoxical way, increasingly active in his protests against violations of human rights in the Soviet sphere. And while he had been making quiet appeals over the years for various dissidents, among them Boris Pasternak, he became more vocal in the 1960s. For example, he was very concerned about the cases of Andrei Sinyavsky and Yuli Daniel, a pair of satirists whose works were smuggled abroad and published. In 1965, they were arrested for Soviet activities, anti-Soviet activities. They were then tried and sentenced to hard labor. In September 1967, Green wrote to the Secretary of the Union of Writers and asked that any royalties owed to him and any money being held for him be paid to the wives of the two imprisoned writers. At the same time, he wrote a letter to the Times about the imprisoned satirists, remarking accurately, that if it had been sent to Pravda or Izvestia, it would not have been published. 
he outlined his decision concerning the royalties and stated that he could no longer visit the Soviet Union, of which he had such happy memories, while these men were in jail. Green was narrowing his protest to a question of human rights and did not want his words to be seized upon by the Americans, so added these wild remarks. There are many agencies, such as Radio Free Europe, which specialize in propaganda against the Soviet Union. I would say to these agencies that this letter must in no way be regarded as an attack upon the Union. If I had to choose between life in the Soviet Union and life in the United States of America, I would certainly choose the Soviet Union, just as I would choose life in Cuba to life in those Southern American republics like Bolivia, dominated by their Northern neighbor, or life in North Vietnam, to South Vietnam, but the greater affection one feels for any country, the more one is driven to protest against any failure of justice there. This statement was made while in his fiction, he was working out what he took to be the holy moral grounds for Morris Castle's defection. Even so, the line of thought is unreasonable. If Graham Greene had been a Russian writer, he would long since have vanished into the gulag, and he, know, and he knew it. This statement, though very ill-judged, had a clear purpose. He wanted to make sure that his protest on behalf of Daniel and Sinyavsky was useless for American propaganda. Unfortunately, he was never able to live it down. And yet, Green was as good as his word and refused to visit the Soviet Union until the Gorbachev years owing to the treatment of dissidents. In my new biography of Graham Greene, I go into various instances of how Green led protests on behalf of dissidents. How do we make sense of all these contradictions? To put it simply, he hated both the American and Soviet systems and was not going to align himself with either. As we know, in later years, he attempted to break out of the East-West paradigm by aligning himself with countries in the developing world, the Chile of Salvador Allende, the Panama of Omar Torrios, and the Nicaragua of the Sandinistas. But that is a subject for another day. In later years, Green clung to a personal loyalty to Kim Philby, or perhaps just to the idea of Kim Philby, as he had not spoken to him in years. He provided an introduction to Philby's book, My Silent War, and received a note of thanks. Then nothing more. In the mid-1970s, he fell in with a documentary maker called Laszlo Robert, who was also a Hungarian intelligence agent specializing in Catholic targets. And this man attempted, unsuccessfully, to broker a meeting between Green and Philby. Green reported these contacts to Morris Oldcastle, an old friend who had become head of MI6, and it turned out that Laszlo was already known to them as a spy. Nonetheless, Green was anxious to make contact with Philby. However, he could not go to the Soviet Union owing to its treatment of dissidents, and obviously, Philby could not come to the West for fear of arrest. In early 1978, Philby sent Green a postcard from Havana and so opened a correspondence. There weren't many letters, and when he received one, Green usually passed it on to MI6 through his brother-in-law, Rodney Dennis, who had been a senior figure in the service. As Green put it to Burgess in one of his angry letters of June 1988, you must be very naive if you think our letters were clandestine on either side. The KGB and MI6 were both involved in the correspondence, and at one point it appeared that the Russian service was passing a note to the British concerning its disapproval of the recent invasion of Afghanistan. Philby called it an infernal business and added, I need hardly tell you that I am very unhappy about it. What may surprise you is that I have met no one here who is happy about it. It was most indiscreet to speak of the mood of the KGB, and Philby would only have done it with the approval of his superiors. Green and Dennis took the view that the KGB was signaling to the West, however deniably, its disapproval of the war begun by Leonid Brezhnev. Rodney Dennis passed on their thoughts about the letter to Sir Dick Franks, who had succeeded Oldfield as the head of MI6. And yet the connection between Green and Philby was just a matter of letters from time to time, mixing personal recollections, comments on literature, and discussion of world affairs. There is no real evidence that they met in person until the emergence of Mikhail Gorbachev as General Secretary in 1985. At about that time, 
the Writers' Union elected the novelist Genrik Borovic as its Secretary for Foreign Affairs, and he approached various foreign authors, among them Graham Greene, urging them to visit the reformed Soviet Union. Of course, this man Borovic was also an agent of the KGB specializing in disinformation, and it seems that he was up to something. Kim Philby was never fully trusted by the KGB and was given no meaningful work during his first decade in Russia. By the late 1980s, his value as an intelligence asset was utterly exhausted. It seems that Borovic was using a reunion with Philby as bait to bring Green to the Soviet Union. He tried something like it with David Cornwell, who writes as John le Carré. Whom he made a visit to Moscow and there was approached by Borovic offering a meeting with Philby. Cornwell rejected the suggestion with scorn and for his efforts was subjected to a full body search on his way home. In any event, Green made five visits to the Soviet Union between 1986 and 1988, spending a good deal of time with Philby on four of them. By the time of the fifth, Philby was dead. The first visit in September 1986 bought Green to the book-lined flat Philby shared with his fourth wife, Rufina, near Pushkin Square in Moscow. Philby said right away, please, Graham, don't ask me any questions about the past. Obviously, he did not care to be questioned, but perhaps he was also reminding Green that the flat was bugged. From the Soviet side, this visit probably had nothing to do with actual intelligence gathering, but with symbolism and public relations. According to Borovic, this visit was approved by the leading reformer, Alexander Yakovlev, soon to be pro promoted to the Politburo, and cleared by Mikhail Gorbachev over the objections of old-time apparatchiks. Of course, in the background, according to David Cornwell, Raisa Gorbachev often had a hand in bringing foreign cultural figures to the Soviet Union. Green made a return visit five months later in the depths of a Russian winter for which he brought neither hat nor boots and had to be guided by hand through the snow. At Philby's flat, he remarked, you and I are suffering from the same incurable disease, old age. He complained how difficult it was now even to take a shower. Eight years younger than Green, Philby was facing greater difficulties. He had emphysema and a failing heart. Green's other purpose on this occasion was to participate in a grand forum for a nuclear free world and the survival of mankind, featuring 600 writers, intellectuals, and activists from around the world. It was to be a showcase for the reformed Soviet Union, even as on the streets, reactionary elements of the KGB were beating up protesters and journalists, including the Guardian's Martin Walker. As perhaps the most important living writer from the English speaking world, Green was given special treatment from the second most influential member of the Politburo, Yegor Ligachev, an ally and later rival of Gorbachev's, who specifically invited Green to return and spend time in Siberia where he himself had been born. But that was not all. Participants in the round table met Gorbachev himself. When Green approached in a small group, Gorbachev, Gorbachev shook his hand and said rather mysteriously in English, I have known you for some years, Mr. Green. It is not clear whether Gorbachev was a reader of Graham Green, there were millions of them in the Soviet Union, or had noticed his name in intelligence reports concerning Latin America, where Green had extensive dealings with the leaders of Cuba, Panama, and Nicaragua. Yakovlev, Ligachev, and Gorbachev were the three most powerful figures in Russia. Why did they care whether an elderly British novelist visited the country? It is entirely possible that they took seriously Green's long ago comments about being willing to live in the Soviet Union. Or, more likely, they thought he could become an enthusiastic advocate for the new Soviet Union in the West. As David Cornwell points out, authors are held in greater esteem in Russia than in the West, and they probably overrated Green's influence. And still, it seems that they wanted him as some sort of trophy and his various anodyne meetings with Philby were a small price to pay for this. During his travels, they offered him the Order of Lenin, which he turned down because he did not want to believe that he had secretly been a communist through his life. Indeed, despite briefly joining the Communist Party in Oxford as a lark, his politics over many years can best be described as social democratic. There is no evidence of him adopting radical leftist views. 
and this despite having a complicated admiration for Fidel Castro and Daniel Ortega. He had written to a friend in 1985, Russia and the USA seem to be the same face looking at each other in the same glass. And there are times when I certainly prefer the Russian face to the American face, similar though they both are. And yet, for Green, the mirror was deceptive, even distorting, and he would have preferred to smash it. He did not want to be too deeply involved with either side. His sympathies were in the developing world. The Soviets did not quite understand this. At the end of the forum, Green was asked to give a speech, and without preparation, he addressed the smiling Gorbachev and made the case that Catholics and communists could work together. We are fighting together against the death squads in El Salvador. We are fighting together against the Contras in Nicaragua. We are fighting together against General Pinochet in Chile. After a pause, he added, and I even have a dream, Mr. General Secretary, that perhaps one day before I die, I shall know that there is an American ambassador of the Soviet, did I say American? An ambassador of the Soviet Union giving good advice at the Vatican. This last statement seemed odd, but Green knew that some such thing was in the works. Having broken diplomatic ties, the Vatican and the Soviet Union exchanged ambassadors in 1990, and Green did live to see it. Green took, Ligachev's, took up Ligachev's invitation six months later and traveled with Ivan Cloeta to Siberia and saw Novosibirsk and Irkutsk, as well as Tomsk, which was usually closed to foreigners because of its nuclear facilities. Along the way, a delegation of five senior KGB officers came to pay their respects. The novelist was certainly being flattered. Back in Moscow, Green and Cloetta died with the Philbies and discussed Peter Wright's then controversial book, Spy Catcher, the candid autobiography of a senior intelligence officer, which claimed that the one-time head of MI5, Sir Roger Hollis, was a mole and that he was responsible for tipping off Kim Philby prior to his defection. Green was probably watching his old friend's reactions very carefully through this conversation, but then Philby never was an easy read. Meanwhile, back in England, a news article appeared to the effect that Green was in Moscow to help Philby with the second volume of memoirs. Nicholas Elliott, who had confronted Philby in Beirut in 1963 and who gets rough treatment in Spycatcher, wrote to Elizabeth Dennis. She was Graham's sister and his private secretary and the wife, and the wife of Rodney. She herself had been a member of MI6. Elliott wanted to know what was going on. An old friend of Elliot's, she later conveyed word from Graham that the memoir story was false and that he thought Spycatcher both inaccurate and boring. Given his earlier pattern, there's no doubt that Green reported to MI6 on his experiences in Russia. It is hard to believe that there were remarkable revelations. Even so, many old friends and colleagues such as Nicholas Elliot could not understand what he was doing and perhaps to some extent the problem remains. In February 1988, he returned to the Soviet Union for the airing of Borovic's laudatory documentary on him. This also marked the only occasion that Kim Philby appeared on television during his years in Russia, sitting in a pinstripe suit beside Rufa before a row of P.D. James novels in his study. He said that Green, quote, rather dropped out of my life during my troubles but made contact again when I came over here. He spoke for 10 minutes in praise of Green and of the perfection of his portrayal of the CIA and the quiet American. He was happy to gloss over any disagreements they had ever had. I wouldn't say that our views coincided, but he belonged to those few who at least sympathized with me. This was the last time Green would meet with Philby who died a few months later. And yet Green did make one more visit to the country to receive an honorary doctorate and to attend a reception honoring his 84th birthday, held by the Writers' Union at the Soviet Skaya Hotel in Moscow, which was also attended by Philby's widow. Green interrupted a toast to himself as guest of honor to propose one of his own. I want to drink to the wife of my close friend who died not long ago and to whom I was bound by warm memories. He then blew out the 84 candles on his cake. It seems a rather banal ending for a mysterious relationship that stretched through 50 years. 
I think it is generally fair to say that the Soviets were not especially interested in Green's visits as an opportunity to obtain any significant points of intelligence. Rather, they wanted him in the country and praising its reforms as a sign that the country was at last coming in from the cold. Whether British intelligence gave Green specific tasks to perform in the USSR is simply unknown. It's not very likely as he could make no discrete contacts in the country being so closely watched. In future, with the release of secret documents, we may come to understand a little more about what otherwise seems a risky dalliance with a foreign government intent on seducing him. Of course, one aspect of Green's enthusiasm to visit the USSR at the time may seem mundane, but worth remembering. He hated to think of himself as written out and probably hoped a last novel might come of these experiences. It didn't, and the loss is ours.